Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, very much for joining us uh, here at Brookings. I'm Martin Indyk, the Vice President and uh, Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Uh, one uh, very important and very active part of the Foreign Policy Program is our Energy Security Initiative, which is uh, directed by um, Charlie Ebinger. Uh, and uh, Charlie is going to uh, moderate uh, the discussion uh, today. But we're very uh, honored and delighted to uh, welcome Minister Ola Borten Mo, who is uh, the Minister of Energy of Norway. Um, Norway is a small, rich uh, Scandinavian country, Nordic country. Uh, but it is a giant when it comes to the energy sector. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, the Minister uh, Ola Borten Mo is, as Minister of Energy, has a, a very important uh, role in um, developments in uh, the energy sector. Um, he was appointed Minister of Petroleum and Energy in, in March of uh, 2011. Um, he has had a distinguished career in the uh, Norwegian parliament, representing Sør Strondelag County, and before that in uh, local uh, government. He's uh, served on uh, a number of uh, committees, including, uh, of course, the Energy and Environment Committee, and he's chaired the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Business and Industry, and uh, is also uh, the vice chair of the Standing Committee on scrutiny and constitutional affairs. He is, I think, um, it's fair to say, amazingly young for a Minister of Energy, and that is an indication uh, that he is very much a rising star on the Norwegian political scene. Um, we uh, cherish our relationship uh, with Norway here at Brookings. It's been a very uh, productive and fruitful one, and we're very grateful uh, for the support uh, that that uh, we received from the Norwegian government, and we're particularly uh, pleased to welcome again back um, to Brookings, uh, Vega Stroman, uh, the Norwegian ambassador. Uh, the minister is going to uh, speak about Norway's oil and gas policy in the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic uh, is a domain which uh, is of increasing importance. Um, it's uh, an area of... Uh, international uh, engagement that has uh, come onto the scene in a way uh, that has grabbed the attention in Washington only recently. Uh, whereas for Norway, it's been an abiding uh, concern uh, for many years. And the potential with climate change for uh, exploitation of the resources there, for the opening of, of the sea lanes, uh, and, uh, of course, the impact that this can have on the indigenous population is an issue, is a range of issues that, that we are now focusing on here. So it's particularly timely uh, to have the, the Norwegian Minister of Energy to address these topics today, and I would ask you to join me in welcoming him to Brookings. Thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, introduction uh, and thank you also for the opportunity of coming here today to discuss matters that are of great importance for Norway, um, energy issues that I think is also important for uh, the world uh, and uh, uh, things that uh, could come up in the discussion afterwards that I'm really looking forward to. It is a great pleasure for me to hold a presentation here at uh, Bro Bro Brookings, one of the most respected, trusted, and quoted think tanks in Washington, D.C. I have been looking forward to this, and I'm pleased to see so many of you here today. Initially, uh, before talking about oil and gas policy in the Arctic, I feel that it is necessary to emphasize that there is no race for the Arctic. 
and that the Arctic is no lawless space. I sometimes get the impression that the common understanding is the opposite. Well, that is incorrect. The Arctic is governed by five countries, namely Russia, Norway, the United States, Canada and Greenland. It is this way now and it will be this way in the future. One possible outcome of meeting claims under the UNCLOS, um, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea for Continental Shelves, may leave less than 10% of the Arctic Ocean not under coastal state jurisdiction. This is the shaded area uh, on, the, on the map. This is, of course, also depend, depending upon the United States ratifying the Law of the Sea Treaty. And why this has not happened yet um, is puzzling to me. Let me also say that there are a few differences between the Nordic, the Norwegian Arctic and uh, the Arctic uh, for some other countries. Our parts of the, Nord of the Arctic um, does not only have indigen indigenous, indigenous people, but it's all, we also have cities all the way up to, um, uh, to the Bidens Sea, all the way up to the northern parts of Norway. We have the Gulf Stream, meaning that uh, our parts of the Arctic is um, with less ice or no ice, uh, and there's quite a lot of activity in, in these areas. On Wednesday this week, I had the pleasure of visiting Statoil's shale oil operation in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. In fact, this is the main reason for my visit to the United States this time, the shale oil development in the US could have major implications for the oil market and a need to understand what is happening. I am a strong believer in open and transparent markets as, key element, as a key element to increase energy security for both exporters and importers of energy. Price signals are the most efficient way to allocate resources. Actual prices and price expectations for crude oil um, and innovation, prices and innovation, are the two most important factors behind the surprisingly rise in shale oil developments. These factors are also the main reason why oil and gas activities in the Arctic are on the increase again. The world of easy and cheap oil is definitely gone. America's assumed need to import natural gas has vanished over a very short period of time. The breakthrough of shale gas has changed the world of energy. The important question now is, will the econom economic viability of oil sands and shale oil, which is produced in North America, do the same for oil? Will increased production and more efficient use of oil in the US make North America energy independent, the dream of all presidents since Nixon. It is, um, n it is too early to know, for sure at least, but this American dream definitely seems more achievable than ever before. If it should materialize, it will probably change more than pure market dynamics. Also, the geopolitical dynamics uh, of the world will profoundly change. Norway's history as a host nation for oil and gas activities is considered a success story. Many would say that this is due to luck since Mother Nature has been so kind to us and given us large resources. We have large oil and gas deposits, ample supplies for water, for electricity and power production, as well as potential, potential for developments when it comes to minerals. We also have other natural resources like rich fisheries uh, and forest resources. 
But our success at a, as a petra petroleum nation has mainly come as a result of the way we have managed our petroleum resources. There are many countries in the world with the richer um, natural resources than Norway, also per capita. But Norway's story is different and mainly a success because of the main, because of the um, um, way we have uh, managed this resource. I think it's several reasons for this. First of all, Norway was a developed, mature industrial nation when we first discovered oil on the day before Christmas in 1969. We had foresighted politicians who decades ago laid the foundation for our present petroleum policy. There has been a high degree of political consensus over time to ensure sound management of our petroleum resources and stable and predictable investment conditions. International oil companies tend to find the level of taxation higher in Norway than many other places. We tend to answer, point one, it's not as high as you may think, and two, it is predictably high. So, uh, and this is the way it's going to, uh, to be. Um, I think it's also important that we early decided to invite the international petroleum industry to the Norwegian continental shelf. And at the same time, we started to build our own knowledge and competence. A strong national oil industry has developed over the last um, four decades. Since the mid-90s, income from the oil and gas activity has enabled the Norwegian government to establish and grow a sovereign wealth fund called the Government Pension Fund Global. It is now the world's largest sovereign wealth fund and it will provide financial security for Norwegians for generations to come. As we speak, this fund holds assets worth, worth approximately 700 billion US dollars. Finally, Norway has always combined principles of sound resource management with strict regulations on safety and on the environment. Let me give you two examples. Since we started oil production in Norway back in the 70s, early 70s, flaring associated with natural gas has been illegal except for emergency purposes. Furthermore, Norway introduced a tax on CO2 as early as 1991. As a result, we have one of the world's lowest emissions per unit of oil produced. This is good but we still have to push efficiency going forward. Some argue that regulations like this reduce competitiveness. On the contrary is my message. It makes us early movers and spurs innovation. And if we go back to our oil and gas industries, they are now delivering their services, their goods, at an, at an international market. We are present in the Gulf of Mexico, outside Brazil, Angola, and Asia. And next to oil and gas, this has become Norway's most important source of export revenues. In a country of five million people, more than 200,000 people today work within this industry. Today, Norway is the world's seventh largest exporter of oil and the second largest exporter of gas. To maintain this position and to obtain maximum value creation, we need to maintain a high and stable level of activity. Our strategy includes efforts to be carried forward on four areas in parallel, and we need to succeed uh, at all four uh, to, uh, to, to make this happen. This also tells us that what we are do doing is not resource tapping. We are able to maintain production through innovation and to increase human capital uh, and 
uh, create human or possibilities for, for, our, uh, for our population. But number one, the recovery rate from fields in production shall be increased further. When we started back in the 70s, we typically thought that we were able to produce uh, up to 20% of the total resource base. Today, we think that we, on, on average, could uh, make uh, the recovery rate up to between 40 and 50%. And who knows what this number will be in the future. And for every percent we are able to increase the recovery rate, we will produce values for the Norwegian society in the range of 50 billion US dollars. So this is extremely important to us. Number two, we need to develop all discoveries that are profitable. Both these measures are time critical because you need to do it while you have the infrastructure and the competence. Uh, some people tend to think that the oil could be put could be produced at a later time. Uh, well, uh, this is not always true when it comes to increased recovery rates and um, profitable discoveries, small uh, profitable discoveries, they often rely on existing infrastructure and competence. Three, active and thorough exploration in areas open for petroleum activities on the Norwegian continental shelf. And, acts and um, we make new discoveries in areas that already are open. And the most recent example is the Johan Sverdrup field. This was the largest offshore discovery made in 2011. Alone it holds up, it could hold re resources for more than 3.2 billion barrels of recoverable oil. And the mind-gobbling thing about this field is that it was, found, it was found on the most mature part of the Norwegian shelf. On a part that was a part of the first licensing round in 65, we, or the industry has done drillings and seismic for almost 50 years, uh, and it showed up uh, last year. Actually, um, one French company is supposed to have been one and a half meter from the reservoir at an earlier point uh, of history. Um, probably the, the one and a half most expensive meters in, in world history. And then we will need to open up new areas for petroleum activities. After more than 40 years of production, still we have only opened up half of the continental shelf. A necessary requirement for success is healthy competition between capable and motivated oil companies, in particular major oil and gas companies that possess particular skills and competence as well as capital and the ability to take risk. Further, we must develop new technologies and undertake focused R&D programs and activities. Petroleum activities in the Arctic is nothing new. The first onshore well was sunk in the McKinsey River as long as almost 100 years ago. Since then, more than 400 Arctic oil and gas fields has been discovered. However, their development has been slow, chiefly because of the high costs of operating in the Arctic. In our national debate, this long story is little known. People seem to think drilling in cold, dark areas is something new and frightening, and that oil activities beyond the Arctic Circle is a completely different business than further south. south. Outside Sakhalin in Russia, oil and gas production in ice-filled waters is happening today. So uh, this is also the situation in Alaska, in Prince William Sound outside of Anchorage. And the presence of ice is handled in a routinely, on a routinely basis. A picture of the platform outside the Iceland is shown on the slide. This is from the Sakhalin field. By the way, it is designed by the Norwegian company Kvarner and based on technology and experience that has been developed at the Norwegian continental shelf. Demand for reliable energy supplies and the expected oil and gas resources available are the major driving forces behind the growing political and 
industrial interests in the Arctic Oceans. More advanced technologies and higher oil prices are other. As I said earlier, the cheap and easy oil is gone. There is no doubt that the importance of the Arctic is growing. I will share with you where we are in our waters. In Norway, the first well in the Biden Sea was drilled more than 30 years ago. The first discovery was made soon after this. Um, over the years, more areas were made available. However, we need, needed to enter a new millennium before the first development could start. During the last decade, we have been on a very positive trend. Through a thorough process involving all stakeholders, we established broad consensus about establishing the Biden Sea as a new petroleum province on the Norwegian continental shelf. In the, in the planning process, important elements like integrated management plans are introduced, impact assessments are carried out, we need to base ourselves on the best available knowledge in evaluating future petroleum activities. It has never been our policy to open all areas on the continental shelf at once. We have applied a stepwise approach. This will also be the case for the future. The slide shows the status for the areas in our north. The green area is available for petroleum activities. The yellow areas have special arrangements. Opening processes are ongoing in the southeastern Biden Sea, which is the earlier disputed area with Russia and around the island of Jan Main. The northeastern Norwegian Sea is in a phase of knowledge collection. will probably be decided by the upcoming elections if they are to be opened up or not. We have good progress in our ongoing opening processes. My plan is to submit a proposal of opening these areas for petroleum activities to our parliament in the spring of 2013. This also means that the um, mandate to open new areas for petroleum activities in Norway is vested with our parliament. Let me give you an update on all the activities in the opened areas. The optimis optimism regarding our high north today is based on the actual discoveries. Development projects and exploration activities in the Biden Sea. Fifteen years ago, this area seemed to be without any future. Today, our aim is to maximum value from the Snowwit gas field, which started its production in 2007, to finalize the developments of the Goliath oil field, to develop Skurugard Havis, two recent large oil um, discoveries, large enough to support, uh, support their own platforms, to mature other potential commercial discoveries, to continue to explore uh, areas in licensing rounds. We have two ongoing rounds in the area, the 22nd round and the APA 2012. We have already seen that there is a great industrial interest in more acreage in the high north. This summer I announced the 22nd licensing round and out of 86 blocks announced, 81 is located in the north and 72 of these are located in the Biden Sea, shown in pink on the map. This underlines the fact that Norway as a petroleum nation is moving north and that activities are going to um, uh, do the same. I am confident that the round will result in awards of many exciting new blocks. Like in all previous licensing round, I look forward from to I look forward to receiving high quality applications from the industry. In summary, it has taken more than three decades to establish Arctic Norway as the fully fledged petroleum province it is today. 30 years since we started going north, we have finally passed the starting line and we are speeding up. A significant part of our energy future will be in the Arctic.
But make no mistake, it will still take considerable time to develop the resources. We are prudent and responsible resource managers. These perspectives create promising opportunities for Norway, especially in the form of positive economic and social effects in uh, the North. We have seen enormous economic effects in the Hammerfest area already, generated by the development of the Snow White gas field. Being a member of the government, my wish is obviously that such ripple effects shall materialize in other regions of our high north as well. As part of building a prosperous Arctic future, this is in my view what we all should want for the Arctic at large, not least to the benefit of the population in the area. This requires a clear insight and prudent political decisions, both for the short term and for the long term. Such decisions must be based on facts, knowledge and experience, and they must be taken with due consideration of the potential future effects of petroleum activities on the environment and other users of the area. Petroleum activities in part of the Arctic are demanding, commercially, environmentally, technologi techno technically and climatically. Handling of these challenges requires knowledge, creativity, innovative skills from the petroleum industry at large. As always, I firmly believe that these challenges can be met. The industry is innovative and has overcome big challenges before. Therefore, these challenges will not stand in the way of growing oil and gas activities in the north. This being said, it is important to note that the Arctic represent different sets of challenges, depending on what part of the region we refer to. For example, one big difference between the Arctic in, say, Alaska and the Norwegian Arctic waters is the presence of the Gulf Stream, ice in Alaska, clear waters in Norway. In order to develop petroleum activities in the high north further in a responsible manner, we need that industries, politicians, governments and consumers together have the capability, flexibility, attitude, skills and creativity to address the challenges and implement sound solutions. The contract between society and the industry is fragile. And this, I think, is an important vocal point. In Norway, the license to operate depends upon a contract between the industry and the population. The population demands security for the environment, ripple effects, possibilities for developments and growth onshore. I think this um, contract is on place in Norway today. But to keep this license to operate, this contract has to be renewed every day. The industry must deliver sa safe and responsible operations every day. The Macondo accident was a wake-up call. The likelihood of such accidents ever happening again is reduced considerably through joint industry efforts and requirements by public authorities. Accident of the scale seen in Macondo must be avoided in the future no one of us can afford something, something like that happening uh, again. Petroleum activities on the Norwegian continental shelf are based on the highest standards of health, safety and the environment. This, of course, tr is of course also true for our activities in the Arctic. It is the common responsibility of each of the Arctic coastal states and the petroleum in industry to implement and apply such standards. To succeed, dialogue between our countries are very important. The same goes for sharing of experience, transferring of knowledge and discussing lesson, lessons learned. Such dialogue is important on the political level and even more important between our experts and the industry itself. 
This is important uh, in itself, and it is necessary for maintaining uh, a license to operate. To ensure that petroleum activities in the Arctic also benefit societies, we are occupied with ensuring local and regional ripple effects. In our experience, such ripple effects are obtained through activities offshore. Without activities offshore, there will be no uh, ripple effects um, onshore. To ensure the prudent exploitation of our oil and gas resources in the Arctic, we must further develop and ensure the use of new cutting-edge technology in order to protect the environment. The role of the petroleum industry in this process is also extremely important. It is a matter of responsibility, a responsibility that the industry is fully aware of and is implementing every day. Close operation and interact, interaction with the scientific community are essential elements if we are to achieve our overarching goals for the high north. I have therefore decided to establish a research and competence center focusing on challenges related to petroleum activities in Arctic environments. The center will collaborate with leading research communities in Norway and abroad. In conclusion, Norway will continue to be a stable and predictable supplier of oil and gas. We will develop our part of the Arctic the responsibility of developing the Arctic lies with the coastal states. There is no legal vacuum in the Arctic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Moe, for a very uh, profound overview of the most challenging parts of the world, obviously, for the future of the oil and gas industry. While we're getting mic'd, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask just one or two questions, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of time for questions from the audience. When we go to the audience, if you would please identify yourself, uh, your institutional affiliation, but most importantly, ask a question rather than make a statement. Uh, you come out, Mr. Minister, very strongly uh, uh, that the Arctic governance uh, by the literal states is is in place, functioning, and that there's certainly no lawlessness in the area, and I certainly would agree with that. However, we know uh, that there are other countries of the world that have a different view of that, uh, either because they believe that global climate change is affecting uh, themselves directly, uh, a position articulated quite strongly by uh, India and Singapore, for example, as well as countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, and others, either because of their interest in access to fisheries in the region or under the doctrine, in their view, of the common heritage of mankind, that they ought to at least, uh, if not have sovereignty, have a seat at the table, so to speak, in the Arctic Council. Uh, and I was wondering if you have any further amplifications on that or whether you feel that your initial position that the literal states are the governing body and we should leave it at that. I would opt with the, the last one. <coughs> Uh, very clearly. I, I think it's, it's very important to state that uh, this is uh, a matter for the coastal states. Uh, when, and I said when, <laughs> and I hope you will, uh, when you will um, ratify the treaty of the Sea of the Law, uh, I think there's no doubt that almost the entire area will be under direct control of the different coastal states, and this, of course, means that this is as much Norwegian, uh, Canadian, uh, Russian, American waters as any other waters. Uh, I also think that all these countries uh, have uh, over decades and centuries proved that they are sound and responsible resource managers. Uh, and I think that uh, every state should continue to do just that. This is not saying that no one else are entitled to have an, an opinion, uh, that no one, no one else is entitled to have uh, sound views on how and what uh, and when. But when it comes down to uh, uh, 
to the table to the hard facts well uh, this is uh, uh, this, this, is a, this is a question for uh, the coastal states. Thank you. My second question is, and this goes back to uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity that I had back in 1975 to visit uh, Svalbard um, and to become acquainted with the provisions of the Svalbard Treaty, um, which of course, as I read the treaty, at least at the time it was uh, signed many years ago, uh, grants uh, equal access to Svalbard to the treaty signatories while clearly recognizing Norwegian sovereignty. If that interpretation is correct, does the Svalbard Treaty in any way affect the future prospects when oil and gas exploration might move farther north into the Svalbard archipelago in terms of how countries that were signatory to the treaty might have particular access or the right of access uh, to the region for hydrocarbons? Well, from, from our point of view, it could do so if it turns out that there are resources that uh, the Norwegian government will approve uh, to be developed onshore. Uh, when it uh, comes to the offshore areas, uh, our position is that this is a part, no doubt, of the Norwegian continental shelf uh, and shall be, uh, of course, be, um, be developed as such. But uh, as you know, onshore developments and onshore access to resources are regulated by the treaty. Uh, and you will also at Svalbard, uh, as many of you know, find substantial Russian activities uh, mining coal. Thank you. Okay, let's open it up to the floor. I uh, hope we have some spirited questions coming. Yes. Hi. Uh, Travis Drummond's from the Institute of World Politics. You spoke mostly about oil and gas exploration. Can you speak to the possibilities of using the Arctic for energy transportation? I, I think that if we see the waters clearing up as to some more time with ice-free waters, this will no doubt uh, make the sea route uh, between Europe and Asia a lot shorter. Uh, and that will not only be important for energy production, but also for all, all kinds of transportation of, of goods. This could change the dynamics uh, between uh, Europe and Asia. When it comes to uh, energy transportation, it is already, at least in our waters, uh, a quite substantial amount of energy production and transportation. A lot of it is done by boat, uh, and we need uh, together with Russia, for our part, to have um, a very, uh, we need to have, um, uh, pay attention to this transportation, to avoid accidents, and to uh, have capacities to clean up if an accident should occur. So this is something that we uh, pay a lot of attention towards. Uh, of course, uh, no one would like uh, uh, or can afford something going, uh, going wrong uh, in these waters. But as I said initially, uh, there are a lot of people living in these areas, both in Norway and in Russia, and there are a lot of activities in the waters already. Not only energy, uh, but also uh, other kinds of transportations and activities. Yes, in the back. Uh, Brian Spack, Green Strategies. <clears throat> I, my question is about the Arctic Council and, and your view on the degree to which uh, the Council should have international standards. Uh, you say that all of the Arctic states are responsible resource managers, but I think <coughs> I would say that some are more responsible than others. And it's in all, particularly Norway's, but everybody's interest to have responsible standards applied throughout the region. Do you think there's a role for the council to play in setting policy across the Arctic states, or should it remain within each uh, the domain of all the sovereign nations? I think that the Arctic Council has a very important role to play as a moderator, as a place for developing knowledge, uh, for um, initiating research, uh, for um, having system uh, that ensures uh, um, the fact that we are able to share this information, to discuss this information, what it means. Uh, but uh, 
at the end of the day, uh, I think it will still be the responsibility of each of the coastal states to, uh, to do the actual resource management uh, of these areas. So it's, it's not, so I don't see it as, it's not opposite positions, it's just fulfilling, outfilling uh, each other. The Arctic right. Council is very important. Anybody else on the floor? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm uh, John Stan from the World Bank. I have a couple of questions concerning uh, these new developments uh, for uh, expo exploitation of particular gas, but also oil uh, in the U.S. Uh, so far, they haven't really put much downward pressure on the world market price for gas. It's only happened locally, but over time, that probably might be the case. Have you had any? Do you have any ideas of whether that could affect Norwegian policies in any way, or? Uh, you know, the, the price trajectories for gas and oil, are they different than they were before as a result of these new developments? I think that there is no doubt that the developments in the United States has already affected M Norway. And if you take the Snow White facility in Hammerfest, which is our first LNG facility, finished in 2007, uh, this was designed and built for the American market. But by the time we were able to finish uh, the factory, there was no American market. Uh, we were able to send, I think, one shipload of LNG from uh, Snow, Snow White and Hammerfest to, to the US. So, of course, the reality of uh, the Norwegian market profoundly changed uh, over just a short period of time. When it comes to how is uh, the shale gas revolution going to affect uh, international oil and gas Prices. I think there's, uh, well, uh, there's many things pulling in different uh, directions. Uh, a lot of it has to do with domestic policy making in the United States. Are you going to allow the exports of oil and gas resources, or this, or is this something that the United States is going to develop mainly from its domestic uh, markets? One very important question. But also, uh, how is the world economy going to develop? If things are going uh, good in Europe and in Asia and in Africa, demand will pick up and we will see um, long-term high prices on energy, no doubt. Uh, my view, I'm an optimist. I think that we will have sound economic development globally, pushing energy prices, if not upwards, so at least keeping them at a fairly high level. And I also think that easy oil is gone meaning cheap oil is also uh, gone. Uh, and that will make it economic viable for, to develop the kind of resources that we are talking about here. Uh, deep water, high north, uh, uh, and that affects Norway uh, heavily. In the back. Uh, hello, uh, Randy Jennings with uh, P51 Consulting. Uh, my question is in regards to Greenland. With Greenland um, being an Arctic player, but not a sovereign state, yet increasingly sovereign, um, do you see Greenland as replacing, potentially, uh, the Danes, eventually? Um, they've had a difference in between, say, seal hunt, between what Greenland wants to do and what the EU wants to do. And then what is your interaction as Petroleum Minister with Greenland and then with uh, Copenhagen? We have, of course, close uh, cooperation with both. Uh, and as you may know, Greenland is not a member of the European Union. Denmark is. Um, the relationship between Greenland and Denmark is, of course, a question that Greenland and Denmark have to sort out for themselves. Uh, but uh, uh, no doubt both are going to be uh, important uh, parts of the development um, in the Arctic. Greenland is a enormous uh, area. I don't think, uh, I do not think that the seal issue is going to be uh, of great importance. Um, and uh, by the way, I think uh, the Norwegian government and the uh, people of Greenland has the exactly same uh, point of arrival when it comes to uh, seal hunting and, uh, and whaling. Sound resource management. Over in the corner. <clears throat> uh, 
Thank you. Um, my name is Anita Parlow with Parlow and Associates, and I guess I have a question recognizing you, you made a distinction between the uh, warming warmer waters off Norway and the more ice prone uh, off Alaska, for example. Uh, if one is thinking in terms of, uh, of issues such as um, uh, spill, spill response capabilities, anticipation, mitigation, and, and response capabilities, how do you look at how this aspect is emerging, realizing on the one hand, perhaps it's significant for a 100-year event, but on the other hand, there are a lot of other little things leading up to that 100-year event. And uh, given what happened with Shell uh, in their best efforts uh, in the Arctic, how do, how do you look at that dynamic and where are we today uh, with respect to that dimension? I, I think that there is a profound understanding among the different governments and the industry that no one can afford uh, a big mistake uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and even with the Macondo, the Macondo uh, had a large impact on the Norwegian uh, domestic debate, although this was uh, far away from Norway and a lot of things were very different. But it, uh, it was a wake-up call and it reminded us all that things c could uh, go wrong. I think that we have just started to, uh, to discuss uh, and debate how we are going to meet uh, this challenge uh, together, not necessarily in um, the way of uh, developing common capabilities, but to uh, uh, have systems, and to have uh, research, uh, innovation, uh, technology, <coughs> to make it possible to, to handle an event if it should occur, but most importantly, how to prevent such a thing uh, from happening. And this is one of the areas where I think that it is uh, very important to have interaction uh, between the states, between the companies, between the research uh, institutions. Um, I am quite optimistic when it comes to uh, to the big question, uh, will we over time be able to move further north? And the way I know this industry, it is extremely innovative uh, and uh, have, at least in Norway, been able to um, answer to the society's demand for more security, for better solutions, for sound resource uh, management. And there's no doubt, uh, there's, no there's no reason that this devel development should, should end. So, so there's an interaction between the governments and between the government and the industry and the research institutions. I think we have time for maybe one more question because they're on a very tight schedule to see Secretary Chu this afternoon. Michael? Hi, Michael Ratner with Congressional Research Service, and I'd like to thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I have <coughs> two questions. One, the first one's probably a, a short one. I was wondering if you had any advice for uh, the people in North Dakota when it came to flaring, um, given your <laughs> remarks. Uh, I'd be interested in what you told them. And the other question is more, uh, I guess, a philosophical question. A couple of times in your presentation, you, you talked about, or you mentioned that the era of cheap oil is over. Uh, <coughs> Does the same apply for gas, and, and which I don't think it does? So I'd appreciate your thoughts on, you know, will the world move towards consuming more gas, um, and what would it take for that to happen? When uh, Norway introduced its ban on flaring in the 70s, it was not because we uh, had uh, serious consideration for climate change. I don't even think that uh, it was uh, invented. <laughs> uh, back then, but it was it was from a resource management point of view. Flaring a uh, large amount of gas is really a waste waste of resources and opportunities for development. Um, and uh, so we did it. And of course, uh, that to to ban flaring was a very strong incentive for developing infrastructure to make use of this resource. And today, uh, at the Norwegian continental shelf, you will find the biggest offshore pipeline system in the world, supplying Europe with uh, around 20% of its gas consumption. Um, there are differences between 
the Norwegian continental shelf and, and North Dakota. <laughs> uh, but I felt a very strong resonance or a very strong feeling also among North Dakotans that flaring gas is a waste of resources. And they knew that every year they uh, flared enough gas uh, to heat the entire state. So it's not only from a, a emission, CO2 emission point of view, but also from a uh, resource point of view. Um, their uh, projections, projections for the future was that uh, in a few years they would be able to reduce flaring from around 30% to a single digit number. I would very much welcome such, uh, such a development for many reasons. Um, and I do think that authorities, government, politicians have a saying when it comes to, uh, to an issue like flaring. I think you're right. There, it is not necessarily a very, so we could have, I said the end of cheap, cheap oil. Um, I think that what's happened already in the US on gas no doubt has changed this gas markets for decades to come maybe generations but it's also worth notifying that when it comes to unconventional gas resources these resources are literally everywhere in all parts of the world uh, even onshore in uh, in Norway under our capital Oslo uh, <laughs> I do not think we will drill, no. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, but I, I think that there are possibilities for developments also in Europe, and, and no doubt in, in, in a country like, uh, like China. So uh, if you look at the numbers from IAA, the International Energy Agency, I think their last report was called the Golden Age of Gas. And I think that we will pretty much move uh, into that direction. It's going to be driven by three things. The conventional gas markets, pipeline markets, which Norway heavily depends upon uh, today. The LNG, uh, LNG uh, technology is going to be uh, just as important in the future as it is today. And then you have the unconventional resources on, on top of that. But Gas as a bigger part of the global energy solution, in my head, no doubt is going to, to happen. And this is a major advantage. It will reduce emissions and increase efficiency. And what we now see in the United States, I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, mind-gobbling. You are reducing your, your emissions faster than uh, many other or any other industrialized, industrialized uh, country and at the same time increasing your ability to compete. Seems like a good, seems like a good deal. Well, on that note, I'd like you to join me in thanking the minister for a very interesting presentation.